Hi, uh, this is Miss Litton, and this is a lunchtime review of Chapter 15, Darwin and Evolution. Everybody say hi. Hi. <laughs> All right, so a couple things I want us to address right away. Um, I, I picked some scientists that I want you to be familiar with. Um, those were in bold. The smaller print were not as significant. Um, obviously, Darwin, huge. Knowing about the journey, huge. We went through a couple of other items. We talked about Linnaeus. Key thing about Linnaeus is binomial nomenclature. You want to know about that. The naming system that we use currently. Um, we talked about Leclerc and Count Buffoon, but I, I believe I put him small, did I not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so, but he did write a, a history of all the plants and the animals, and he was one of the earlier scientists to even speculate about um, descent with modification. You see here um, Erasmus Darwin, um, Charles Darwin's um, grandfather, also suggesting the possibility of common descent. He looked at things like development. Do we look at development today when we look at phylogenetic relationships? Yes, how they're related to each other. We, um, Darwin looked at artificial selection, looking at vestigial organs as well. That's all kind of shaping his thinking. Um, Cuvier was one of your main guys that you needed to know. Um, he was the first to use comparative anatomy. He founded paleontology. Um, he did not think about common descent. He was fixity of species. He just thought the reason why you, it appears like change over time is there would be these major catastrophes which would wipe out a bunch of species and that's why you didn't see them in the fossil record. Um, Lamarck, you definitely want to know. He was the first to give a mechanism for descent with modification and he used a couple of principles, use and disuse and inheritance of acquired characteristics. That would mean something you acquired during your lifetime. You were not born with it, but you acquired it. You were able to pass it on to your offspring. Because of our understanding of chromosomes and reproduction now, remember, that sounds like not smart based on your understanding. But at the time, um, at the time that was acceptable because um, they didn't understand um, the process of how um, genes are in our form of inheritance. Um, and so he would say the reason why giraffe necks got longer is because they used them a bunch and they stretched them and stretched them so their offspring were born with a little bit longer necks and their offspring were born with a little bit longer necks. Okay, and next, um, then we're gonna start talking about Darwin but you needed to be aware of some of the um, things he was reading when he was on his journey. Um, around the Galapagos Islands. He was reading a book by um, Charles Lyell about geology, and basically that gave an argument that the Earth was very, very what? Old, old. very, very old. Um, then we're looking at things like um, a Malthus and looking at um, the struggle that people had to survive. And so he's applying that then to organisms, that struggle for existence. So let's do a few questions. You do not need to know these years. I just threw them in there. 142 number number, Birds of Oak Park. Um, good job, yellow rumped warbler, California towhee, and American robin. How do you remember that? I gave you a way I remember it. Clerk. Yeah, you have to be a good clerk, right, in order to keep track of all of those um, plants and animals. Thank you. 
Um, okay, so somebody said Cuvier. No. Um, what do we? How do we remember Cuvier and what he did? Paleontology. Paleontology, because you cuvade it with dirt. It's buried. It's an idea. Okay, um, I know what to tell you on that one. It is Lamarck. He was the first one to do that. Um, So a physician would be Erasmus Darwin um, and a naturalist, and he was the one who looked at development, artificial selection, and vestigial organs. Just hummingbird. It's 142 number number. My gosh, yay, one. Woo. So proud. Good job, Alan's hummingbird, American Robin, California Tony. This could be your number two. I believe in you. You can do it. was not on the HMS Beagle, not at all. But Wallace, we want to know about him, right? Because what did Wallace do? He motivated somebody. What did he, he do? He motivated Charles Darwin. He, yeah, he motivated Charles Darwin to do what? To yeah, to release his work, to print his work. Um, about 20 years after Darwin came up with the, the mechanism, natural selection, Wallace got him to print it by um, sending him a copy of his work. We looked at different things that Darwin um, analyzed. Um, he looked at, uh, remember evolution is just change over time. He looked at seashells up on um, raised beaches. Um, he thought about biogeography, that different organisms were adapted um, and different depending on the climate they lived in. He looked at fossils and looked at found similarities between extant um, animals and ones that were living today. He looked at different types of organisms and how they looked like they represented maybe some other species and it became specific that, to that particular environment. Uh, he looked at different um, animals on different islands in the Galapagos Islands, and specifically those tortoises. And when he saw those tortoises, um, he, he looked at something on those tortoises. What, what, oh, terrible. What did he look at on those tortoises? Oh, the curve of the Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, that's. <laughs> vegetation from trees. E. I agree. And you're going to say that because it has the what? The curved, curved shell. Okay, great. All right. So he saw those differences in those um, tortoises. And so he's looking that that would be signs that were they specifically created on each island or did they become more adapted to their environment over time? And uh, as in opposition to Lamarck, who said, it's not like they just kept rubbing against their shell and they wore it away a little bit up at the top and so their offspring were born with a worn away shell there a little bit. What he would say is the ones that survived and made the offspring, the ones that were the most fit, were the ones that already had a little bit of a what? Curve. curve. And that's saying some had the curve and some what? Didn't, Didn't have the curve because there would be what? Variation. Variation. And if it's the ones that were curved that were surviving that made it most fit, there must have been what between them? Competition. Competition. Okay? So you have, what's the first part? Overproduction of young, right? And of those young, they have what? Variations. Not all of them are going to survive. The ones that do survive are the most fit. And fitness has to do with the possibility of passing on your genes, your DNA. Good. And that you have vast amounts of? Vast amounts of time, okay? And then Lyell, it was his readings, when he was reading his book, that gave him the idea that you had um, an old earth, okay? And he looked at things, what do you call it when an organism is only found in one location? Endemic, Endemic yes. Ooh. Endemic, good. He also looked at some finches, and finches were examples of what? What is? Oh, it's on the slide. Adaptive what? Radiation. Radiation. And they're exploiting every niche that's on that island in order to reduce the competition between each other. They're not having a meeting and saying, hey, you go for here, you go for here. It's just that those that went and took advantage and had the right beak and had the right feet to live in that particular area of the island and eat that food, those are the ones that survived and reproduced. And over vast amounts of time, you got very specific in your finch capabilities, what you could eat and where you could live. Okay, and so then he wrote Origin of Species. Again, Wallace motivated him to do that because he wrote something very similar to what Darwin had. And um, again, based on variation, based on having a struggle, and not all are going to survive. Some are more fit. And we looked at adaptations that we saw um, in different organisms. And you picked your favorite ones of the eagle. And then we differentiated between what convergent evolution is. If something has convergent evolution, they're dealing with the environment in the same what? way, right? In the same way. If you're going to swim, possibly something you would want is a what in order to help you swim? some sort of fin. If you're going to fly, you want some sort of wings. That just means you're dealing with the environment in the same way. And you would look at a bat's wings, a bird's wings, um, a bee's wings, a beetle's wings as being what kind of structures? What do you call that? Analogous structure because they have the same function. But if they have the same anatomy regardless of function, if they have the same anatomy regardless of function, then it's called what? Homology. And which one shows relatedness and is a piece of evidence for evolution? Homology. Homology. Good. All right, so we looked at convergent evolution. We looked at artificial selection. When you say artificial instead of natural, who is doing the selection? Man's, Man's doing the selection, nature. And we looked at that in dog breeding, etc. cetera. Um, we, uh, and plants. Parallel evolution we talked about. Parallel evolution, you would have a common ancestor, just not a recent common ancestor. And in parallel evolution, you ended up at the same spot. You ended up having some of the same features and characteristics, even though you don't have a recent common ancestor. But you are exploiting the environment in the same way. 
you're a large herbivore and you're living in the environment in that way. If you're a small herbivore, okay, you're living in that environment that same way. We looked at that between um, placental and placentals and marsupial mammals. Okay. Just don't have a reef manifestor. And then we started talking about, what did we do? Oh, we talked about um, the different pieces of evidence for evolution. And that part, if you were um, absent, that one, that one piece of the lecture, I was able to record all of that, and that is posted, okay? Um, but let's just kind of break each of these down. What do we know about fossils? You have to be how old to be a fossil? And what is a fossil? It is either the actual organism, right, preserved, like an amber, or it's what? outline of the animal or any kind of imprint left behind that, by that animal. And we know when we look at, at fossils that, first of all, to be a fossil you have to be preserved in some way and not only preserved but found and identified in order to, to see that and use that as a piece of evidence. That's difficult right there. Um, and because most organisms, when they die, they're either going to start doing what? What happens when you die? You start to what? Decompose, or somebody ate you and broke you into even smaller pieces and digested you. So this is something that either died or got itself, either in ice or in amber, um, was able to get mineralized, become petrified in some way, um, leave an imprint behind so that we could view it. Are there transitional fossils? Yes. Yes. Okay. And. So we looked, we looked at a few of those, okay? We saw the transition between fish and amphibian, and amphibian and reptile, and reptile and bird, and mammal. And a really good example when you're studying the evolutionary history is use the horse, because you can see how it changed um, over millions of years. Okay, we looked at biogeographical evidence, we've already talked about that. Um, so your evolution is linked to your climate where you're living and you're adapted to that particular environment. We related that to the plates moving and a good example I said you might want to use is looking at what? The, the evolution of what? It starts with an M. The, uh, moss. Not moss. That's industrial melanism. Mammals. And how mammals... Um, when mammals were evolving, the continents had already broken apart, and that's why you have very specific mammals on different continents. Okay, on we, and there's your endemic species. Then on your evidence for evolution for anatomy, there were three. Homologous structures, which we already discussed. What was the second one? Analogous. What? Not analogous. Analogous is just function, a second piece of evidence. Yes, vestigial structures, we looked at that. And the third one? Anatomical. Yeah, yeah, they're all anatomical, and then embryological development, okay? So there's three. So when you talk about anatomical evidence, there's three parts to your anatomical evidence. Okay, you can look at homologous structures. You're not concerned with analogous structures. Analogous just has to do with function. Homologous is the same structures, so that must mean you have the same DNA coding for the same proteins, and if you have the same DNA, you're probably related, okay? Um, and we looked at vestigial structures that show you where you could have evolved from. A salamander who has a withered eye, and the whole group, the whole population of them that have withered eyes, that must mean eyes don't contribute to your fitness any longer. But because they do have eyes, probably at their ancestral past, a population of salamanders, the eye was important. Why wouldn't the eye be important to this group? Because they live in a what? Cave. cave, and it's dark. That is a vestigial structure. When you look at a whale and it had a hip bone and a femur, okay, that's a vestigial structure because it's no longer using that. It's no longer contributing to its fitness. But that tells you in the past it probably what? Walked. Okay, so that shows to where you came from. The more similar your um, anatomical structure is during development, probably the more closely you are related. Also, when we look at our development within the womb, it's almost like evolution on fast forward. Because we have what? Gills and we have a tail. 
Exactly. Okay, then the last piece of evidence that we looked at all was related to biochemical. And that has to do with analyzing the DNA or looking at the genes, looking at proteins and comparing those, looking at similarities that we all use ATP. We look at those cellular processes like cellular respiration and those steps. And um, you can see those are some conserved processes as well. So in this case, you're analyzing cytochrome C, which is used in cellular respiration and you're comparing the sequence of amino acids, which is the primary structure of a protein. And the more similar the primary structure of your cytochrome C, probably the more closely what? Related. And specifically, you could look at genes that control development and make comparisons as well. Not only in the anatomical structure of looking to see the features of development and the structures, of their body, but actually looking at the DNA and looking at similarities in those developmental genes. Okay, and then that would help us to understand why we have this huge diversity. Okay, here you go, some questions. Sorry. It's windy in Camarillo. I may not be golfing today. Yes. For analogy structures, that's evidence for a convergent evolution because they have the, like the same traits and like different. Evidence. You have to, when you look at an analogous structure, you need to take caution because it could be a result of convergent evolution. Maybe it's homologous too, right? The bird and the bat, it is the anatomy is the same and it is a wing that's used for flying. So you have to investigate, make sure it's not a result of convergent evolution. Okay, now, how did we know to pick analogous structure on this answer? How, how would you explain that to somebody? Yes? Because the flipper and fin are a function. Uh-huh. And that's what analogous is. And that's what analogous is. Do you have something else on there? The dolphin's a mammal. And, and the dolphin is a mammal and the fish is a fish. Okay, good. And a fish is a fish. It's not a mammal. Okay, why did somebody pick B? Because they didn't do what? Study. No. I, I think they just didn't read it carefully. Is that a possibility? Has that ever happened to you on a quiz where you have been erroneous in your reading and then afterwards you're like, oh, I knew that one, right? It's probably happened to all of you, so be careful when you read. Or if you're just not, I don't know what to help you on that one. Do you think this chapter is important? Yeah. Evolution, is that one of your uh, big themes here? Yeah. Got to know this. <laughs> uh, okay, why did I pick a dog kidney? Yeah, dog needs a kidney. It's not vestigial. It's super important. Okay, you might have to go to doggy dialysis. Okay, so, yeah. A, a human tailbone is a vestigial structure because none of you have tails. Um, C, a pelvic girdle in snakes, that is a vestigial structure. Probably don't. Um, and that is that's why they're so reduced. Yeah. Yay! Okay, now listen to me. I know what some of you are thinking. 
I know some of you are thinking, God, wouldn't it be great to not take the test on Friday? It makes for a difficult weekend for you. You need to just buckle down and get it over with. We have finals that you need to start preparing for. And if you ask, which you know I'd always be willing to, I'm not tied to any one date, okay? So it's not like I don't wanna not have you take it, but I'm trying to help you out. Because as you start getting ready for your finals in English and your other classes as well, and even preparing for this final, you need to get this. It's just like a glorified mega quiz, right? It's 50 points, bear down. Yeah, because you're not doing essay. Bear down, get it done. And then you have the weekend to start concentrating on some other things, other classes, or even this class if you need to as you get ready for your final, okay? So start that studying, don't wait until uh, Thursday night, all right? You're super smart, and if it's late at night, have a piece of toast. <laughs>